Where are you? Ruby, how was it? It was great. It, it, it got the seal of approval. So last night, uh, David said that uh, he views all of his films as comedies based on the amount of romance in this film. I think this is probably the greatest rom-com ever. <laughs> the man of the hour, Joe Lynch, come on up. Hell no, I am not the man of the hour. There are many men and women of the hour who are here tonight. Uh, I am merely a messenger. Uh, Ruby, right? Pretty, pretty freaking awesome. Uh, I want to take you guys back really quick before we bring our special guests out. First, give it up to Beyond Fest. I mean, come on! The entirety of Twitter needs to be then here tonight, so hashtag Cronenberg better start trending real fucking soon. Um, let me take you back really quick to 1986. Um, my family had this weird tradition in our household where if we wanted to go see a movie, we had to get our homework done first. So there were certain movies that we got our homework done real fucking fast. Uh, Creepshow 2, boy, 20 minutes. I was, I was checking out the raft in 20. Um, but where my mom was a huge horror movie fan, my dad, not so much. Um, but he, this was kind of his rule, so he was like, get your goddamn homework done at home. Take it, okay, whatever. Um, and the movie on the menu for that time was The Fly. And now, I was excited for this movie because it was made by the guy who made the sweetest images of Fangoria. I mean, uh. if you grow up with Fangoria, and you will very soon again, um, you will remember opening up those pages to seeing those images from the brood and seeing that exploding head from scanners and seeing Dr. Oblivion's cancerous face all fucked up with Rip Baker's makeup and you just went, I will see whatever this person makes next. And if you also remember Fangoria, they would do like seven articles about one movie over the span of like four or five months. So you were just completely saturated by these images before the movie even came out. So in seeing these, these images that these filmmakers created, it was like, I needed to see this movie. You know, this is 1986, so I was 10, and I was like, Ruby, you beat me. You totally beat me. Um, but I had to see this film, so homework done. Movie, we're at, we're at the film, it's a Tuesday night. And again, my dad does not like horror movies. And to watch him jump when Brundlefly jumps through those like real 80s windows in the doctor's <laughs> office, you know, the bricks, right? To watch him jump like that, and then, 15 minutes later, I'm looking over, and my old man, who, he was a biker, he was a tough son of a bitch, he's crying. He was, it, like, to the point where he's like, for your eyes, like, just like, turn away, don't look at me! <laughs> to have a film that is that powerful, where it could stoke the flames of sci-fi fans, or horror fans, and also be the love actually of 80s horror films. I can definitely attest to. The fact that this film, the chemistry between our two leads, which is essentially a, ch a chamber play, you know, it, which makes total sense that it would become an opera, because if you hear those first strains from Howard's score, it's almost like the film is kicking the fucking door open and saying, I'm fucking here, goddammit! And it's so powerful to see that. A group of people. How many people have not seen the film until tonight? Fair enough. You're welcome. Uh, but for everybody else, for all of us collectively to sit here and watch a movie that we've all seen, whether it was in the theaters or you know on CBS Box Home Video or on the Laserdisc or on the DVD or on the Blu-ray or you know streaming or whatever, and for this movie to impact us all tonight the way it did, not just because we have some of the most amazing guests, or Beyond Fest has brought the most amazing guests tonight, but this film cooks. This film affects you. This film infects you. And I could not be more honored and proud to bring three of the collaborators of this film here tonight. We have composer Howard Shore,
Um, one of the things that is, is so amazing about, thank you guys for being here, by the way. This is a, tr a rare treat that my, my screen grates, my Fangoria uh, flames are stoking like crazy. You know, we're not really here. It didn't happen. <laughs> this is the era of that. So is it virtual or augmented reality? No, it's just a lie. <laughs> so my 10-year-old son was going to wake up in that movie theater and be like, it was all a dream. No, it wasn't. Um, the, the thing that I, I was so impressed with watching the movie tonight, and Gina, it was great to watch you watch the movie as well. Uh, what do you think? It still holds up? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> was how film, and, and films, like in your filmography especially, uh, they, they all evolve. I mean, films in general evolve. They're, you know, cinema is subjective. Everyone brings something different to the table. But, you know, a film like The Fly that came out in 1986, and I know there was a lot of um, kind of post-discussion about how it's an AIDS parable, or but it, it's so much more than that, and it never was. It was never your intention, from what I, what I remember. And how the film, at least to me, when I was 11 or 12, I was like, yep, that's puberty. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a 12-year-old kid, that's what it felt like to look in the mirror and go, am I dying? You know, but to so many different peoples and so many different walks of life to be able to see themselves in Seth Rundle and, you know, and in Ronnie and, you know, and in all the characters in this, this chamber play. The, the thing that, that I was really fascinated with while watching the movie tonight was in the opening of the film, everyone's walking around with programs that say art and science. And Thinking about where you were in your career at the time, um, you know, this is coming off of uh, Dead Zone, and I remember um, reading in uh, many, you know, magazine articles because you know did keep up on your career um, that you were at the time you were uh, developing Total Recall, and how that unfortunately fell apart, and you were in LA and you were kind of looking for a job, and Brooks Films kind of <coughs> swooped in and presented you with this um, with this idea, which was uh, Charles Pogue's original script. Where were you at that time? Take us back, if you don't mind, to that time where you were this artist in a, in a way, kind of... Because very much, like, Seth Rundle, to me, was, like, reminds me of, like, you back then. Not that I knew you back then, I wish I did. But that, that feeling where you're almost like uh, this roguish artist slash scientist. You know, I, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> That's a lie. Thank you, the fifth. Yeah. I, I think I was drunk a lot. <laughs> but that's not true. Uh, yeah, I do remember. I mean, I had a good time trying to make Total Recall with uh, Dino De Laurentiis, and I spent a lot of time in Rome. And actually, I spent time in Tunisia looking for locations for uh, what would play Mars in, in uh, Total Recall. And I think I wrote 12 drafts over the course of a year. And uh, we just, we had some serious um, disagreements about um, what the movie should be. And um, uh, I can't remember all the details of it, but uh, yeah, so at that point it was like, I need, you know, I need work. I was it something that you stepped away, or was it just a mutual, like, let's, let's part amicably at the time? Or? Well, it was amicable, but uh, I think it was my choice to... You know, I realized I wasn't going to be able to make the movie that I, I wanted to make. It wasn't going to be, yeah, in fact, I seem to recall, and it's not total. <laughs> <laughs> one one she said, one she said, had, had been involved in Alien, and they came out, and he was a producer for it, you know. And at one point, he read the script, and he said, well, you know what you've done. You've, you've, you've written the Philip K. Dick version. <laughs> He said, as though that was a bad thing. <laughs> we have notes, and we're faithful. Yeah, I thought that's what we were doing, because it is a novel, you know. And um, that was where we had a disagreement. He said, no, we want it to be Raiders of the Lost Ark, go to Mars. <laughs> uh, and now uh, I'm sure that, you know, even if I were on the Supreme Court, I could swear to that. <laughs> and that's how the dialogue went. So, and yet, no, I can't remember what room we were in, what 
hotel or what city, but I do remember that expansion well. Uh, so I realized that we were trying to make two different movies, and, uh, and I didn't want to make that one. Now, uh, much has been written about your collaboration with Mel Brooks, Brooks Films, who's uh, one, of, one of the producers of the film, um, to use a bad pun, to be a fly on the wall in that, those conversations. Oh. You know, I know, hey, you, you brought it with the Total Recall one. Sorry, we <laughs> opened the floodgates there. Um, but I'm the guest here. That's fine. <laughs> <good. laughs> um, touche. Touche, sir. What, what were those initial conversations like, sitting down with Mel? Because I, I know, I, I remember there was the, this one story about he was the one who came up with the uh, be afraid, be very afraid quote. Is that true? Yes. True, truth or false? Well, one of those things you want to talk about first. Hmm, let's see. Uh, let's talk about you and Mel in a room. Yeah. <laughs> so Mel and I were in the room. Uh, actually, it was Stuart Kornfeld, who was basically the line producer of it, who, who came to me first and offered it to me. And uh, I read the script and I said, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, and then they came back to me and said, you know, we'll pay you twice what you got on your last film. And I said, well, pretty interesting. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, but you have to understand that I cannot do this script. I mean, there are a couple of good ideas in it, but basically at the character level, it simply doesn't work at all. It's really kind of not interesting. Um, I would want to completely rewrite it. I would want to throw out the first 17 pages. Uh, and then the, the characters in, in Chuck's um, script were they're long married and kind of bored with their marriage. I said, no, I want to see these people meet. And I want to see, you know, it was completely different. And they said, he said, you can work do whatever you want. So I thought, okay, twice the money, and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I've never gotten that deal since. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that was the basis of it, and I didn't meet Mel for a while after that. And, um, and, and yes, I had written the script, and, and at one point Mel was saying about that particular moment, he said, no, when, 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 she, uh, when, he, when he says, don't be afraid, uh, yeah, the answer should be, Yes, be afraid, be very afraid. You should say, be afraid, be very afraid. He wasn't really giving me dialogue, he was just reacting. And I said, yeah, I'm going to put that on the script. <laughs> so, um, so let's say it was a collaboration. But yes, it was no. Uh, so this was also your first studio film, with, uh, working with 20th uh, Century Foxes. I mean, Dead Zone was... Uh, no, it, 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 honestly, it was the same. I had never done a studio film. There was always somebody in between me and the studio with the Dead Zone, it was Dino De Laurentiis Productions, and with, uh, with this one it was, it was no, it was Brooks Film. So I was never a direct in-house studio, it was always somebody working with the studio. Because obviously if you look back at the, the, the kind of the trajectory that the film took and the life that it led, I mean obviously it was the film that got my dad out on a Tuesday night. It was a very mainstream film. Everyone, I remember when it was first first released, it was presented and marketed and released as a mainstream film. Did did Fox have any? Did did they augment your workflow at all? I mean, obviously you had the in betweens, but was there anything on a studio level or a bigger level? Very much like you know, going back to Seth Brundle and how he was kind of underfunded by Bartok. You know, was there a higher power? guiding you along the way at all. Are we talking religion now? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get deep. No, I did have to talk to studio executives at times. I remember sitting with Barry Diller, who was the bunch of the box at that time, and it was just the two of us in the room, and we were watching a movie together. And at a certain point he said, this could, this could, this could actually be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he awesome thought it was gonna be, you know, some for him, like a relatively expensive schlocky horror film, and, and it was suddenly kind of good. And then he had one criticism that was so odd, and this is the kind of thing you have to deal with all the time in movie making. There was a scene where the frontal fly, finally the creature, the end creature, comes out of the pod, and I had a shot of the tail of the creature kind of dragging it out. He said, I don't like that shot. You know, I got rid of that shot. What? What? Uh, I said, um, you 
know, you might not like it, and I understand that. But the fans will really want that job. They need that job. And, and at that, he, he said, okay. <laughs> Sir, the fans. I, I think he, he realized that he didn't understand certain things about the movie and about the, fan, the, the audience of the movie, and he accepted it. So, I mean, that was okay. And that was really, that was it. Probably my, the, the most, the, the real linchpin of the film, come on, uh, <laughs> is the chemistry between Seth and Brock. That like, now more than ever, there's so many scenes in this film that relate more to tragedy, you know, and, and pure romance than what you would normally expect for a schlocky horror movie, which is, I'm sure, what Barry responded to. On, on that level, when it came down to casting, did they have any say in, um, in how you were picking between Jeff and Gina and John? I, I, I did have to fight for Gina. I mean, I had my eye on Gina because I had seen her in the, you did a, a TV show. And, uh, and, um, and uh, of course, Jeff knew Gina. And, uh, but they, I, I said, I, I think we need to cast Gina because she's tall. <laughs> Jeff is very tall, and we need, you know, that was my, you know, kind of baseline argument. And, uh, and cast Eritrea. Okay, well, and, you know, they, had, they always go through crazy ideas about who is, you know, who's hard and who's valuable and who, and, and it's always very subjective, but they try to pretend that it's actually objective, but it isn't, it's, it's subjective. Uh, so they made me uh, audition quite a few actresses. <laughs> and uh, and the Stuart Cornfeld was there. And um, I managed to subvert all of those auditions so that they were all bad. <laughs> Could you just do it again, but worse? I said, hey, you know, Stuart, it's gotta be Gina, you know that, don't you? And finally said, okay, okay, yeah. So Gina, did you go through the, the process. You were like fourth or fifth in the rigmarole of that day, you know, doing all the screen tests or whatever, so I was trying to sneak in, in a way. You know, I never even until this minute thought about, well, there was probably other people. <laughs> I mean, it never occurred to me that there were... I, I knew I wanted the part really badly and, and, uh, and uh, felt like it was a challenge to get it, but I never thought about them thinking about it. I don't know. I, I just didn't. You know, I mean, I could mention the name, but it's, it's basically like they must have had a list. Yeah. Uh, and and you weren't on it, and for whatever reason, and uh, and and uh, they just needed me to look at each of those women. Well, I wasn't very known or anything. At no, I know. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Did I they was... not see Transylvania Six Five Thousand? I mean, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, but uh, but I was. Famous for me. I was just girlfriend. <laughs> that's kind of what got me the end. In fact, that's why, because I read it when he, you know, got the part and everything, and I read it, and uh, he wanted me to read it, and I was like, oh, I want that part. You know, we get, we kind of thought that would be amazing if I could get that part, but we knew it was going to be a challenge. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I when I auditioned Gina, I just I knew she was terrific, and she was. I was just so perfect. I didn't want to look at anybody else, and I guess give them their credit, they felt due diligence required that I look at some other people just in case, just in case. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that, that is so striking about the movie is, is the, the chemistry that you two have. There's the scene right before the steak experiment where you're talking about the, you know, the why old ladies like babies. And the fact that there's that sensuality that is almost kind of thrown away which is, you see the light bulb go off in his head. And if you guys didn't have that chemistry in the film, it would never work. And on the flip side, the, the moment when you hug Rundlefly right after his ear falls off. <laughs> I mean, I, re I remember hearing a story like during a test screening, like didn't the, the audience like laugh or something like that when they, like the, the first time that they had seen it? They didn't know how to react in a way. Uh, well. Well, Jeff and I had this idea opening night. I mean, the, the day that it that it opened, we were in New York, and we were gonna we went to Times Square to see it. The biggest theater we could find, to stand in the back and and watch it. And uh, 
And it's so fun to watch a movie like that. I mean, even, even tonight, we heard people react audibly throughout the, the movie. And, um, and this was a very important and touching scene to us, you know, that, that I overcome my incredible revulsion to it and, and embrace him just like something horrific that just happened. And so we, you know, knew that this was an incredibly significant and meaningful scene. And so I didn't think about the fact that his ear falls up and then I hug him on that side. <laughs> you know, I just pressed right up against where it fell up. And the reaction in the audio, you know, the enormous theater was so loud and long that you couldn't hear the next two scenes. <laughs> Any of the dialogue. People were just, oh my god! <laughs> We should have thought of that, baby. <laughs> I did think of it. <laughs> Obviously, you had worked with David for you know, 
years at this point. What was it about the fly that, what inspired you about the fly to take that kind of elevated stance in the sonics? Well, I was working towards this sound uh, for quite a few years. This is the fourth film that I did with David. Um, previously was The Brood and then Scanners, Video Drum. And I was slowly working my way to this sound, really. And there were elements of this in the earlier film. But this is a purely symphonic score. It was something I was interested in musically and developing. And I was really interested in Italian opera. So I really wrote it as a tragic opera, uh, which was not, at the time, that really a popular way to approach a genre film. It wasn't really being done this way. Where they were simply were using big orchestras, like the, the sounds of this film. Um, but it was something I was interested in, and you know, I kind of worked my way into that symphonic sound. I have one, one cue in particular tonight that reminded me of, again, being in the opera that evening, was um, the moment when Seth realizes where, who the other uh, traveler was in the, in, the, uh, in the pod. And this cue, and it's this fade to black, you almost expect intermission to come up, you know? And, and again, it's, it's another element that takes the film to, to a, a much grander level than what you would expect, you know, in terms of horror films at that time. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it, it just seemed completely natural to me. It, it just didn't seem like a, a, a it was not a political uh, or socially progressive uh, instinct on my part. It was just a human artistic instinct. For example, um, with existence, uh, I, I was having, it wasn't writer's block, I just wasn't, the movie wasn't working until I made the lead character a woman. And then suddenly it all fell into place. And so that was not a political decision or anything like that. It was just, uh, and it just had to, it, it was intuitive. And, and the same with, uh, with Rabbit, you know, the lead character is a woman. That was just, that was just natural for me. It's true, it wasn't common, especially in genre movies at the time. For the lead to be a woman, but I wasn't. I wasn't thinking about that. It, it really was just, uh, you know, I like women, and, and, and I like female sensibility, and uh, and and it, you, I don't think it's, it's a huge part of my creative life. So it's just natural to me. I'm watching it on, upon reflection again tonight. <clears throat> again, in the evolution of our kind of current social and cultural mores, Ronnie is. She's the hero of this movie. You know, like. Oh, oh, stop. Yeah. Um, what, what, what we kind of bring into this movie as a mad scientist film is actually a sad scientist film. And the fact that you are so much, look, there's three characters in the film, you know, and there's no room for damsels in distress in this situation. And there's even a point in the film where I, I was kind of shocked because you used so many profile shots where they look almost exactly alike. There's a complete synchronicity between them. Um, Maybe it's the mullets, I don't know, but uh, you know, in profiles. <laughs> but there's a moment, and even with the sweater that you're wearing, it's, you've become one, and it's almost foreshadowing to the ultimate, you know, uh, kind of symbiosis of you guys at the end. Um, but there's never a moment where the, the, the balance is, is off. You're, you're always, you, you two are always on even keel, you know, um, to the point where you're the one who's more assertive than anything else. I mean, Run the lab tests, you know. Didn't have to do that, um, but yeah, I, it's it's such a testament to to what you guys brought to the table from the beginning, where she's not. It's not pushed in our faces that she's a strong woman. It's just that's that's who Ronnie is. You know, and we we accept it. Uh, yes. Uh, oh oh, Ruby, come on. Ruby said, uh, what is the hardest scene, Gina? What was the hardest scene to film? Gosh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think the, the last long sequence uh, uh, of when we get back to the, uh, you know, the lab and, and all, all that stuff, it was so uh, emotionally draining and so, you know, many different kinds of things happening and uh, and I remember having to loop parts of that scene too, and it was, 
Oh, sorry, so I was thinking, you know, it just was a, it was a very emotional. Tough days in the ADR session for that one, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, you know, I don't really do the cameo thing uh, normally. I did, I was never wanting to do the Hitchcock thing, you know, appearing in, in my own movies. Um, <laughs> Do you remember that? I certainly do remember that. Um, I don't know. Sure you do. I don't know if we can talk about you that. You seem to really relish that. It wasn't, wasn't it true? Didn't you say? Was well, I wasn't. Request? I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to be me. Really? Yes, it was going to be Stuart. You remember that? Oh, no. it was going to be the producer, Stuart Cornfield. And then how did, did I say no? I wanted to be you. You said no. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, said, more like you said that you didn't want it to be Stuart. <laughs> Sorry, Stuart. And Stuart has left the building. Sorry, Stuart. And there was nobody else because we were going to shoot and we didn't have anybody. So I was on the set. And wait, wait, wait. So the line producer was the first person to say, I'll save money and do it. Was that the situation? Or? He wasn't saying he would save money. I think he thought it would be fun. And I thought, I think he, I think in terms of his look and stuff, I thought it was viable, you know? Um, you but see, it looks more like an obstetrician. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see more like a competent obstetrician. <laughs> it was a competent Stuart Bush! Stuart looked like the kind of obstetrician who would botch the operation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was kind of it, so I thought, okay, you know, and I didn't, my face is covered. Yeah, you know, it was not something that I'm happy. I like acting, and it's and and, and uh, but I I think uh, it's 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 counterproductive to cast yourself for me anyway. Whoops. Uh, last question. Uh, let's go in the back. Uh, yes. Give it up. Just the ones in the back. Pardon me. It's okay.